Good morning, everybody. Here we sit underneath the steel grey dawn sky in the northeast corner of magnificent South Africa. To our, my left, your right hand side, a ground hornbill is going. And because you are on live safari and you've got up so early to be with us, I have a surprise for you. David, would you kindly face the camera towards the front of the vehicle? What do you think? There, everyone, is the Inkohuma Pride. And they are doing what lions do best, which is absolutely nothing. Now, you are on a live safari, as I've said. If you've just stumbled across this website, you are most welcome indeed. My name is James Henry. On camera, as you may have heard, is David Eastall. Yes, that is indeed his surname, Eastall. Yes. yes. We don't know where it comes from. And here's the lions now moving. There were two of them here, two of them further on. In Kuhuma Pride, we don't know where the rest are, and we were alerted to their presence by that just primal, magnificent African sound of lions calling just before the dawn. So hopefully they'll do that again. But it is a lovely morning, and I think, although we are under some steel grey clouds now, I think it's going to open up and be quite a pleasant sunny day. Well, I hope so. On the other vehicle, uh, there is no one. We are on our own out here at the moment. This is simply because uh, Wendy is still filming a promotional video uh, for Wild Earth, and so that's why we won't uh, be going live with her. You may see her within the sighting every so often. She's standing by just around the corner, hoping for a bit of good light, good sunlight on these lions. But I think for the next moment, or for the next little while, let's sit with them and let's watch what they do. There's a lot of general game around here. I think their opportunity to hunt is probably well uh, disappeared. This is quite bright light for, well, it's not bright for us, of course, but it is quite bright light for any of the animals out here. So let's go and see where the others are. Uh, welcome to it, like I say. Please talk to us, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. If you're on the email, the YouTube chat works very well. It'd be good to hear from you. Ask us any questions you want to especially as I am on my own today with David. Um, we would like to have as many conversations with you over the course of the next three hours as we possibly can. Louise is in the final control, and, and um, she is being ably assisted by Jerry. Sorry, I'm just struggling a little bit with my communications. We'll go again with that, Louise. them all there. Now you can see them all. So, I think I'm hearing your name correctly. Kerga 6 You say that I'm a magician. No, I'm not a magician at all. It is just a simply blind luck that brought us where we are now. I'm just going to call Jamie. She's helping with the promotion today. So I will be talking to her periodically on the Game Drive radio. So you'll have to excuse me every so often. Jamie, come in. Anybody? Mm, please feel free to approach all four here at the junction of Fireside Chat. Copy that, thank you. Nice to look at. Yeah, I've heard. Um, I don't know if you can hear them, everyone, but just off sort of in front of the vehicle, so right hand side of your picture, a very strident calling of at least one ground hornbill, a beautiful sound of the pre-dawn. They always call just before the sun comes up. Huge, endangered, turkey-like bird with a massive chisel-like bill. And that's about all the light we have here at the moment, given that the clouds are very thick. But soon, Things will brighten up, and when we came out here, David and I, it was dark, completely dark. It probably looks fairly completely dark to you, but in about 10 to 12 minutes, it will be light. Now, these lions are still looking around here, hoping that something might not see them. That's why we were sitting in the dark initially, was that we thought maybe 
there might be a prey animal around that had not seen them. But even before we got here, the impala were alarming off to the right-hand side of your picture. And to the left, the wildebeest and zebra were going... <laughs> how they tell each other that trouble is afoot, the danger is nigh. Hello, Ola Nick, an interesting question from you. Welcome to it, it's lovely to have you with us. Um, you want to know if these are Transvaal lions or another species. Ola Nick, I don't know what a Transvaal lion is, to be brutally honest. Um, this is the standard issue African lion, same species that occurs throughout the continent. There's some debate as to whether there are indeed some subspecies or whether they're all just one animal. And certainly the animals, the 500 or so of them that occur in India, might be a different subspecies. I've never heard the term Transvaal lion. And so I think this is just the, well, I know it is, it's just the standard issue African lion, which is Panthera pardus. And like I say, some scientists uh, will tell you that there are a few subspecies and some will say it's just the same animal. So I wouldn't refer to it as a Transvaal lion, but, Ola Nick, I'd be very interested to know where that comes from, um, which part of, uh, which book you've been reading that's given you that term. I'd be very interested to know. Thank you for your question. Look, look, look. So some information on the wireless from Louise. Thank you, Louise uh, and Jerry. Apparently a Transvaal lion is a, supposed to be a subspecies and possibly also known as the Kalahari lion. Now, look at this. They're going to play now. Just watch the right-hand side, Dave. There we go. She's coming in to say hello. Mm hmm sharpening their claws and marking territory. Now a question from Michelle about where on the reserve we are, which is a valid question. We're right slap bang in the middle of it, Michelle. We're sitting on quarantine clearings, uh, so called because it used to be used as a sort of quarantine boma, so if you, for species that were brought into the area they would have been quarantined on this clearing for a while before being released, and that's why it's retained the extremely unromantic name Quarantine Clearings. And you'd think it would be called something like, um, I don't know, something exotic, some wonderful Shangan word, or perhaps a Zulu word. No, it is known by the medical term Quarantine Clearings. And it certainly is one of the most attractive parts of the reserve. It's a really nice kind of parkland, which we as human beings with our, with our our human psychology find extremely attractive with big trees and open grass underneath and that tends to make us feel safe. Ah this is wonderful information. Thank you, Angie. Thank you so very much. There's an article or blog from Cheetah Plains saying that the fifth Nguhuma lioness, so there are five of them in this pride, uh, is mating, in fact, with one of the Birmingham boys. Which one are we on there, Dave? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, she is mating with one of the Birmingham boys somewhere around Cheetah Plains, which I think is fantastic. And we know that at least one or two, or maybe even three, of the Styx lionesses are pregnant. We know, too, that they have sired some youngsters at the Mala Mala Pride. So soon the Nkahumas will complete the imperial takeover of the Birmingham boys by producing some cubs of their own. And that will be very exciting indeed. And as I said the other day, when we were doing a little rain section under the rain, under the water, no, what's the thing? I'm, word I'm stretching for? Roof, under the roof, we were doing a rain section and we spoke about how incredibly cute a lion cub is. I think the cutest thing in the bush.
Now that lioness looks to me a bit ropey. She's her hips are sticking out of it. She looks a bit hungry. I don't know which one of them this is. And the Nkuhuma pride lionesses, the five of them, are relatively easy to recognize. We have what's known as the slit-eyed one. She's got very kind of narrow eyes, which is interesting. Uh, there's the amber-eyed lioness, who's my personal favorite, of course. And then we have a sub-adult, who's very clearly a sub-adult, a semi-sub-adult with a few spots on her nose, and then a much older female with a completely black nose, the only one with a completely black nose, so she's at least sort of seven or eight years old. Now, apparently, the best way to identify lions, you can see those whisker spots there just underneath her nose. I have never managed to do it. You really need great photographs. But that's the best possible way. Well, James, Richard, you reckon that these lionesses are smaller than the Styx lionesses. James, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree with you there. I think that they're all pretty much standard-sized lionesses. And... This one certainly looks a little bit like a, a ropey Labrador at the moment, but that's mainly on your picture. I'm, I'm only sitting about mm, 12 meters from her, and uh, although on your picture she looks like a dog lying next to the side of the road, she's actually a lot larger than that, and she's bunched herself up in the slight coolth of this morning. But, James, I think that you'll find... You'll probably find they're actually related to the Styx line. This is, event, um, you know, somewhere in prehistory they would have been related, and I think that they are most definitely the same size. There'll be lots and lots of genetic flow through the population of lions. Okay, let's move a little bit forward and get another look at those others on the clearing there. I think if anything is going to happen, if there's going to be any action, that's where it's going to come from, these ones over here. These brakes are being rusty at this stage. There we go. Ah, oh, this is an interesting question from Ravi. Ravi, your question's always fantastic. Oh, she's that the lioness has spotted something she's thinking about hunting. She's stalking. She's stalking a baby wildebeest. I'm going to move. I'm going to turn the lights down. Let's just go and have a slow look. I mean, it's unlikely that she'll manage to catch anything. There's some zebra watching her. I'm just trying to get... see, yes, you can see. You can see the zebra just beyond there, and beyond them, some baby wildebeest. But those zebra are comp very wily indeed. They've seen these lions. They know precisely what's going on. And Dave, if you swing around quickly to the left there, you can see this one hiding behind a tree, or thinks she's hiding. She's smelling something. And then to the left of her, there's another one just lurking behind a bush. And they're all looking about the place, seeing if they can see something good to eat. So, James, I reckon these are all about 120 kilos. That's a pretty big, big lion, or lioness, 240 pounds or so. And it's so interesting how our impressions of size, especially through a screen, are modified by our impressions of what things should be and what we think we've seen. And I find it, I always find it interesting to, to ask people how big they think a lion is or how big they think a lioness is and how much they think it weighs. And you will find that there's not a huge amount of variation out here. It's nothing like in human beings where some people are my size, some people are Jamie Patterson's diminutive size, and others are the size of Brent Leo Smith. You know, there's such a massive variation in size. Here you'll find that, although there is some variation, it's much less marked. So my females are much smaller than the males. 
you'll find the females in an, in an area, because their diets are very similar, will probably not weigh very different amounts. Deviation of mass between them will be very small. Thank you, Natasha, for a question that I cannot answer. Uh, you're in Ontario, and you want to know how many teeth a lion has. I'm going to guess, and I should probably know, but then I'm going to ask that uh, somebody try and find out for me. So they've got four incisors on the top and four on the bottom, two, four massive canines, and I'm told that they have 30 teeth as adults. So let's work out what those are. There's the four incisors, top and bottom. There are four canines. That takes us to what, David? Twelve. So there must be then hmm, probably one, two, three, eight molars. Five? No, it can't be. That cannot be right. I'll try and figure it out, everyone. Here we go. Twelve incisors, four canines, ten premolars. Four molars. I'm astounded that there would be ten premolars. It means that there must be an odd number on top jaw and bottom jaw. Cool. Thank you very much. That's really nice information. Now, of course, a molar and a premolar on a lion is very different from the molars and premolars that you have. Yours are designed for crushing things like seeds and for mas masticating things like uh, meat and vegetables, whereas a lion's molars are very sharp-edged. They're not flat like ours. So if you run your tongue over the back, your back teeth, you will, um, you can feel that they're flat. They're flat in the bottom here. Whereas if a lion runs his teeth over the back of his, or runs his tongue over the back of his teeth, you will find very sharp edges for cutting meat. And lions, of course, don't chew their food. They just bite off enormous chunks and swallow it whole. She looks like butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, doesn't she? Let's go here. Check this one now. She's, she's lurking behind the tree. stepping out from her hiding place. Yeah, they do look pretty hungry, I must say. Look how beautifully she hides behind there, how she just disappears behind the color of that fallen terminalia tree. Brian, we were talking about subspecies of lions earlier, and the Kalahari lion, what was referred to as the Transvaal lion. And the Kalahari lion, I suppose, might be considered by some to be a subspecies. And then you want to know about the Barnaby lion. I'm afraid I've never heard of a Barnaby lion, unless it's maybe the Barbary lion you're talking about. The Barbary lion, of course, comes from the Barbary area of the Atlas Mountains in northern Africa. And I think in very much the same way might be considered by some to be a separate subspecies, by, but by many, it would be considered uh, the same species. Now, they do, as you say, I'm just going to move around so we can get a better view here. As you say, um, they do have amazingly thick manes that go right down, sort of halfway down the back and down the chest, a bit like mine. My mane goes all the way down the chest. Now, David, yours doesn't, so you're not a Barbary lion. I am a Barbary human being. And Just lurking next to the termite mound, you can only see one lion. But if you look very carefully, you can see one lion's tail sticking out the back. So there you can see a wildebeest in the background. Can you see the wildebeest? 
Yeah. Just stay right where you were, Dave. She's, he's just walking through the, the woodland to the back. There it is, to the left-hand side of your screen, about to disappear. And that's what they're looking at, of course. But the wildebeest know what's going on here. They're very wily creatures. And you can see in the flat light, and by flat light, I just mean the fact that there is no contrast because the sun is not out yet. Everything kind of does meld into the background. Yeah, wildebeest and zebra, huge herd. Now that wildebeest herd has done so well to escape the attentions of the lions. They've managed to raise all 10 of their little babies to the year, to the month that they have now. They're almost three months old now, well, three and a half to four, some of them. And that means that they will be very adept at getting away from things that want to eat them. Hello, Anna. You want to know where tree climbing lions are found? Tree climbing lions, again, the same species as this. Look at them stalking away here. I think they're wasting their time, but we'll carry on watching. The other one's got up and is now moving as well, Dave. Also going behind a scraggly apple leaf tree. Anna, a tree climbing lion is the same lion as this, and they're found often in the Lake Manyara National Park of Tanzania. And it is thought that they climb the lions in order to get away from the biting flies that they have there. And so these lions, as many of you will know, do climb trees sometimes. But it is highly unusual for them to do it here. In that Lake Manyara National Park, you'll find enormous trees. I think they're actually torchwood trees with uh, lions draped about in the boughs. <laughs> Marvellous. It's just, I'm going to give them a bit of space and we get too close, just so that we can make sure we don't disturb them on this, um, what I think is a, uh, well, a, a foolhardy dawn raid. Nice question from Monkey Man here as we watch them sort of on the hunt. Monkey Man, you want to know how close they have to be in order to catch a wildebeest or a zebra. Monkey Man, within 20 meters. Now, the lions are over here to us. They're about 20 meters from us. And then that's, well, that's two of them. And then to the left, there's another one just where I'm pointing now, underneath that fallen tree. To the right of that fallen tree, David. There's another fallen tree with a lion under it. And there they are. And the wildebeest, I'm afraid, are at least 150 meters to in the direction that she's looking. So just over there, under that big green sort of thicket to the left of that. And they seem to have moved off now. You can actually see them moving there. If you go left a bit, Dave, you might see them straight over the bonnet. There we go. So she's got to close down at least another 130 meters. It's an interesting one, Judy. I was just wondering this myself. You want to know, Judy, if these lions are capable of some sort of forethought that they plan their hunt. Um, Judy, I don't know. I think it's entirely instinctual, you know. I think that they do communicate on a level, though, that we don't understand, to be honest. I think that they... When you see them move off on the hunt, it's almost like there's been an invisible signal given, but there's no obvious sound like there is with uh, elephant herds when they move. There's no obvious communication. I think that they do communicate, though. I just don't think we understand exactly how they do it. You also want to know, are they capable of malice and forethought? Um, Judy, I would say that very few animals out here are capable of malice. Are some nastier than others? Yes, to a certain extent, possibly they are. Uh, are they able to plan something evil and then execute it? No, I don't believe that they are. I think they're largely acting purely on instinct. Remember, they don't have a moral code, if you like, that they worry about. They just do what they feel like doing. And I think the closer you get to us, does a, does a chimpanzee, for example, have a moral code? No, it doesn't. But is a chimpanzee capable of... Um, deceit and capable of forethought 
possibly much more so than a lion can, and we, in turn, much more so than that. I think that's a really interesting topic to discuss. Thanks, Julie. There's the other third one's come up here. And I don't know if you can still hear, but those ground hornbills just keep going. Now, Keith, you want to know basically who's leading this charge. Is there a leader, or do they vary who takes down what? Look, these wildebeest are coming up here, Dave. I think they can smell the lions, they can see them, and there's a big bull now come to have a look. Now, the lioness approaching him is about... Oof, Dave, what would you say, about 100 metres? Maybe 300 feet? Just over? But she's definitely been seen. Um, oh, that's a wonderful picture. Look at that wonderful light. So, Keith, I don't believe that um, there's a necessarily a leader. I think possibly if we watch the Nguhuma Pride hunt every single time they hunt, we might find that there's a certain order of things that is maintained. There she comes. They're all alarming at her. But yes, um, they will all take an animal down. Of course, they don't know where an animal is going to run, and often they will ambush it. The animal will run in a different direction towards the lioness that isn't actually hunting, or that isn't actually in the stalk, and she'll then take it down. All right, we're going to move here, just to give you a better view of what's going on. At least the wildebeest are now running all over the place. There's a lioness there. She's approaching the, the herd of wildebeest because she's seen the little ones. I'm very sure that she wouldn't be doing this if there were only big ones there. Just try and get a... When you get a picture of them all, Dave, if we've got a wide enough lens. Yes, we do. There's the lioness and to the left now. Look, there they're running. The wildebeest are running. That's beautiful. Isn't that stunning? Here she goes. She's going to have a go. <laughs> Helping. Hold on. There she goes. I can see her running there, Dave. Just to the left. She's blasting to here. Hold on, Dave. She's running flat out. Oh, she's going fast. Look at her moving. Look at her moving. This is unbelievable. Look at her go. She's still going. <laughs> that was just unbelievable. Oh, my goodness. How she didn't catch one of these little things, I don't know. That's so unusual. You don't see that. She was running like a cheetah after them. And the others just sat and watched in bemused astonishment as she totally discredited all the books on how a lioness is supposed to hunt. She approached them straight across the open. Well done, you clever girl. Well, not so clever, but you certainly gave us a hell of a thrill. I'm just going to try and see which one she is. Now, she's the slightly... She's the kind of... Not the oldest. She's probably the second oldest in the pride. She and Amber Eyes, I think, are very similar age. Oh, that was just fantastic. <laughs> and Brent, I've got her here. She's stopped at the side of the clearing. Confirm the others are still sitting, watching in bemused silence. Brent is also around, everyone. There was He's... one next to Jamie where they were, just watching. I didn't see one of the others also run. Apparently, Brent says, I'm just going to let you hear him. He says he did see some of the others running, or one of the others running, but 
I don't think anything's happened. Let's just stay with our cheetah slash lioness here. I've never seen that before, everyone. I've never seen a lioness run like that. Listen, they're calling now. Listen, here she comes, Dave. There she is. She's calling. Jerry, you're in Illinois and you want to know what the success rate is of a lion on a hunt. Not very impressive. I think you'll probably find it's not more than 20 or 30 percent. So three out of ten, two to three times out of ten, they will catch. If they adopted the approach that this lioness approaches, I think you'd find it would be much less than that. See, she's calling. You can maybe just hear her going, ooh, ooh. This is just too special. Yeah, it's wonderful. Listen to them. Ooh. Ooh. I just can't believe the colors we're getting this morning, everyone. I, I, even in this incredibly thick cloud, the colors of green and tawny and the tree stumps and the beautiful flush of verdant green that we have on the clearings, I just think is so wonderful. Look at her line there. Yes, Kevin, I feel exactly the same way. You say you're out of breath from just watching her. Me too. That was incredible. And you, of course, we don't normally get that across a clearing where we can follow them at high speed and not disturb it. I mean, we were probably about 50 meters to the side of her. Here we go, Dave. Here comes the other one coming in to say hello. Just over there. Now, this is the one I think we refer to as the slightly sort of narrow-eyed female. And she's also not a youngster. You can see her nose is completely black. She's also got extremely swollen nipples. That's interesting. That's very interesting, everyone. She's certainly not fat at all, and they're not suckle marks, but she's got very swollen teats. That's fascinating. This is wonderful. They're all four coming down here now. Here come the others. So as I was saying, in a clearing like this, you can stay with them. You can drive next to them, and it was, I don't know what your picture looked like. I wasn't looking at the picture at all. No, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> Another one. Now, shy me, a very good question there. What happened to teamwork? Well, I think a few things, actually. You know, not to put too fine a point on it, I think they're uh, generally very lazy. It is, of course, daytime, which means that they are, or they realize that everything can see them coming now. And I think you'll find that most of them were totally astonished that their colleague chose to approach those wildebeest straight out in the open. But what she did do was she panicked them. And those little ones, although, well, I mean, she, they're, they're too big. They're, they're quick now. Two months ago, she would have had a very good chance of actually catching one because they would have got tired and they would have probably been unable to keep up that speed for the amount of time that they did. How far did they run? They probably ran about... 400 meters, a quarter mile, it probably ran a quarter mile at that speed, which is, that's, for a cat like this who's supposed to stalk to within sort of 20 meters of their prey, that's quite far. That's a good run for one of these.
And I mean, we were really moving. We were probably doing, poof, at one stage, we were probably doing about, I don't know, about 30 miles an hour. And Christopher, you're in Arizona. You want to know if this is it. That's it. Will they stop hunting now? Will they try and follow that herd? They won't follow that herd, Christopher. I don't think so. I think that herd is probably somewhere near southern Zimbabwe at this stage. Um, so I don't think they're going to follow the herd, Christopher. I think that they will. They might. If, if something comes past here, they think about hunting it. But I mean, they're all four laid out here in the wide open space of the clearing. And that is not exactly typical hunting behavior. I think you'll find that they were hunting last night and probably failed quite dismally to catch anything. And so that's why they just kind of, they'll try anything that they can in the morning before they go to sleep for the rest of the day. We're going around the corner side there, Dave. do is go around the side, just give a better view of them on that termite mound there. <laughs> Diane, you say she's not breathing heavily after that impressive sprint. I agree. I think lions look like they're not running as fast as they are, though. I think they also look like they're not putting in as much effort as they might. And um, certainly, whenever I've seen a lion hunting and, and running, it always looks to me like they're just kind of loping along, but they are going, they've got such an incredible stride length. So the speed is much higher than you think it is, A, and B, they, I think they, they just look like they're not putting in that much effort, but I think you'll find that they are putting in an immense amount of effort to run at that sort of speed. They don't have that kind of, that, um, what we think of is that if you think of a dog taking off running, it's got that incredibly fast initial bounding motion where the legs seem to all blur into one. These guys just immediately launch into this incredibly long, um, uh, long bounding stride. And it looks like they're not going for it, but they're actually going as fast as they can. Here they are on the flat termite mound, not a termite. Exciting was that, David? Um, it must have been the one outside camp. Ah, yes. X-Ranger, you say this is a very good uh, practice for Dave, uh, given the fact that the other day he claimed to have seen a lion chasing something in the middle of the day or just after breakfast. And Brent then went to have a look and couldn't find any tracks. And you say this will help him to identify lions in the future. X-Ranger, I think Brent's been very nasty to David, to be honest. I think I'm pretty sure he did see a lion. And they're quite difficult to mistake. Brent thinks that he saw a kudu <laughs> chasing an impala, which I think is a little unfair. See, I've disappeared, everyone. So don't worry, David, I believe you. Thanks, Brent. Sand Blaster for your comment. You say prime condition these lions are in, and I would agree with you completely. Uh, primed for anything, you say. Um, I'm not sure how primed for anything they are. I think they're primed to snooze. They're hopefully going to have a nice playtime now. There's no heat coming out of the sun yet, so with any luck, they'll do some playing. But the hunting, I think, is going to be pretty much over. But they are in good condition, Sandblast, I agree. I think that they are in very fine condition. And of course, a thin lion is totally normal. They do get skinny if they don't eat, obviously. <laughs> Look at that. See, their nipples aren't nearly as swollen as the other one. 
It's so amazing to watch them like this, kind of being friendly to each other and having this playtime and enjoying each other's company. While if you watch them at a kill together, they will absolutely smash each other to pieces. Let's go up the road here. And hope that they don't go into some thick bush. We're going to turn on the VR rig, everyone. Sorry, Louise, you're going to have to go again with that. Natasha, there's a question from you. I'm coming through. Ah, now you want to know what animal the lions are most successful at catching out here. This pride is pretty adept at, uh, they're quite variable. They catch quite a few buffalo, uh, young buffalo these days, latterly, because they've lost the help of the young male who used to live with them, that's Junior, very, a great favorite amongst our loyal viewers. I'm just gonna turn the VR on now. The VR, everybody, is this uh, ball of GoPro cameras that you can see in the left-hand side of your screen, and that'll give us a 360 view of everything, so like a cylindrical, um, spherical view of the world so if I start talking that way that's why I'm talking that way um, so Natasha this pride be yeah, pretty good with buffalo never seen them catch a, a, a giraffe look over here watch to the left there about to scratch I thought she was going to scratch and then off to the front, of course, the front and left, the other two lions walking down the road. Sorry, my head in the way. All the cameras working, Dave. Interesting. Terry and Santa Anna, since the females do most of the hunting, are they able to run faster than the males? I've read that they can. I don't believe it myself. Um, they certainly look a bit more lithe and flexible, for example, than a male lion does. But a male lion is a powerful, powerful beast, and I think that they are extremely quick off the mark. And certainly they're not, um, I'm just trying to think of the human equivalent. If you look at a sprinter like Usain Bolt, for example, if you look at his build, he's muscly, he's big, he's not, um, he's not a skinny marathon runner type like a wild dog, for example. Um, and I think that the same principle applies to a male lion. I think you'll find that a, although a male lion is, is a big and <laughs> look at them fighting there or playing, although a male lion is a very large animal and built for fighting, they are incredibly fast as well so if we do if we're a little slow getting to the lions on the camera everyone it's because dave is operating of course a ball of gopros at the same time right let's get next to them now what this vr rig for those of you who don't know will do is it will allow a spherical view so if you are eventually you'll see this footage you'll be able to see me talking to you and just over to the left of course you'll see the lions walking in the front one now pouncing into the bushes there coming towards us straight towards the front of the car <laughs> it's so cool i don't know how on earth she got through that huge thicket you'll be able to see the gray sky above Ah, yes. Now, Ravi, sorry, I was completely distracted by, for your question. You wanted to know about the relationship between the local people here who live outside the park and the lions. So one up there on the front of the road, one, two off to the left now. Ravi, you'll find that the fencing here is effective enough to keep the lions out of the villages. So while certainly sometimes lions get out under the fence sometimes they kill cattle the i can hear another one calling way in the distance but ravi basically um it's uh, the chances of a human lion conflict where a 
lion would harm a human being out here are almost negligible. So lions do sometimes get out of the reserve and then they will normally kill cattle and then come back into the reserve. So there, that is not usual, it's quite unusual. The further north you go, the more usual it becomes because the fence isn't in such a good condition. But out here, that's, it's really uncommon. Now the difficulty then, of course, is what happens to that lion when they get out. This one is either coughing or has eaten something distasteful. No, eaten something horrible, going to have a vom. Ravi, um, if a lion does get out, and if a whole pride gets out and they become a menace, obviously it then becomes very difficult to contain them. So sometimes they have to be relocated. But for example, if one of these lionesses got out of the fence, killed the cow, and then came back into the reserve, um, there's a whole arrangement for compensation for the local people if they lose cattle to lions like that. And would just be left alone, but if they made a habit of it, then they would have to be moved. Look, 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 look. They were just fighting there, not fighting, playing. Looks like they're fighting sometimes. We'll just get around in front of them there so we can stop the car and you won't get seasick while you watch these magnificent lions. It's so nice to see them doing something other than lying about, doing absolutely nothing, which is their general default position which is not a criticism of theirs, it's just how they're built. We go through the trees here, just get into a position where we can see them. All just over there to the left-hand side. Just here's amber eyes. Look at her eyes. There, we can see that very obvious amber color. Look at her, she's only about a meter from the front of the vehicle, three feet. She's now hiding from her, she's hiding from her friend or her sister. Look, here they go. This is awesome. Did you hear that? Did you hear the sound of them running? That just gives you an indication of how big they are, of their incredible weight and size. Now, I don't know where the fourth one is. The fourth one's been kind of left behind. Can you see her, Dave? Oh, there she is. She's lying just to the front and left of the car. Brilliant. Okay, let's follow the three who are at. They're off now to the right. If you look to the right, you can see them there. question from Matthew. Oh, look at them go. Sorry, we will try and get into a position where we can see them, but they're stalking each other here on the left-hand side. Matthew, um, you want to know if I think that this green vegetation is disadvantaging them because it's not obviously as typically colored as they are. So if you watch the ones in front of us, so they're walking through that long, what we call yellow thatching grass, you can see how the tawny color is much better suited to that dry grass. Um, Matthew, no, I don't think it does. I'll tell you why I don't think it does. Because they are designed, of course, to be camouflaged when the vegetation is the, at its most sparse. Now, in winter time, when it's brown and, and tawny, the same color as they are, then the vegetation is very sparse. There are no leaves on the trees and the grass is very short, and so it's easy for them to hide. Uh, but in summertime, when the leaves are like this, so if you watch this lioness coming off to the, from the left-hand side here, 
You can see her coming through the green trees. Yes, the colour isn't quite as well camouflaged as it is in the tawny winter vegetation, but there's so much more vegetation, so many more leaves, and the grass is so much thicker that they're able to hide much more effectively than they would be in winter. So I hope that makes sense. I don't think it does disadvantage them. They use camouflage less in the summertime and cover more in the summer, and in the winter they will rely far more on the camouflage because there isn't quite so much cover. And I think the same principle would apply to a leopard. That's a beautiful picture. Gee, that's a lovely shot. <laughs> She's calling. Listen. You hear her? So soft and subtle. You can just see her throat moving. You can just you can probably just see her throat moving there. Wonderful. Now, Star, you want to know about whether that or not they use... You want to know whether or not they use their tails in the same way that a leopard does to basically tell alarm-calling animals that they mean no harm by flicking that white tail tip up. No, Star, I've never seen them do the same thing. That's an interesting question, but no, I've never seen them do that. So they're off to the front, dead straight front. We've got Lioness. She's looking. They're stalking something. Here goes to the left, another one, and behind us, obviously, there's been some communication. Uh, it's the other lioness coming through here. Back far left, she's coming through this thicket of scraggly trees. I thought they were stalking something, but they just saw each other, reacquainted themselves. Now watch. Let's see what happens. Watch the one on the ground and see if she jumps up. Yeah, look at her, just like a house cat, preparing the hind legs. Getting purchased with the claws in the ground. Look, look. Isn't that brilliant? Ears flattened against the... <laughs> that is fantastic. Slight irritation there on the face of the older female. I think that is a... Slightly younger one there. And there's some Impala alarm calling off to the far, sort of right in front of the vehicle. So I think they've smelt or seen these lionesses. So just the three of them at the moment. The fourth one, I think, is just further forward. Brilliant stuff. heavy they are. The mass is quite astonishing. There, way out in front is the fourth one. So we've got two on the right, one on the left, one out in front. And we're heading straight for the one in front. sure that my radio is turned up because if something else happens you do not want to obviously know about it but I think for the meantime we'll stay with these wonderful lions watch them now watch them left and two right one in front and see them stalking each other one on the right now about to stalk the one on the left there they go. <laughs> A combined attack. There you can see the size difference of the one in the middle. Um, Clayton, you want to know if these lions 
had never seen a Land Rover before, would they be so relaxed? Would they be so confiding? No, they would not. They would run. Lions, as you see for the first time, I've seen a few times, they will run away. But it doesn't take long. Because they're so confident, because they know that so little out here is a threat to them, it takes very little time for them to habituate, become used to vehicles, and then just relax completely around you. It's a very good question, of course, as to how on earth we can possibly be so close to Africa's apex predator. Well, second to us, of course. second we've got new cameras because the color is so different that's a really great comment <laughs> so it obviously looks so different from when from what it did say uh, 10 days ago a week ago even and it's so green now you say it's so green that it made you think we had a different camera I think that's an amazing observation and I was thinking I mean I obviously know knew, know we didn't have new cameras but I was watching this morning on the screen on this monitor here that is in the vehicle and I was thinking but the color is just so magnificent I haven't seen this for so long it's exactly what it is it's that everything's gone green now they are stalking slowly through here and I mean they haven't seen anything to stalk oh look here we go to her there scratching her claws just like a house cat would look at that look at the claws So I say they're stalking through here just simply because they have spread out. So they've spread out into that kind of hunting formation. They haven't spotted anything, so it's not like they're about to leap off again. And let me assure you, if we go through this area here, we won't be going at anything like the speed that we were earlier on. There's this youngster. This is a youngster here, the very skinny one, who keeps running up and having a play. been watching some cheetah so they're all on the right hand side now one behind and then the three in front here um jeffrey you want to know if they use their tails as a counterbalance while, ru while running like a cheetah does so for those of you who don't know a cheetah basically has an extremely heavy tail which is used as almost like a rudder it's not like a rudder it's like a counterbalance as jeffrey says where they will fling it from side to side in order to help them change direction quickly when they're chasing antelope or gazelles across the plains. Um, but, Jeffrey, no, I don't think lions would because they're not normally running at those sorts of speeds for that length of time. So I think that you'll find that the tail proportionately is far smaller than that on a cheetah and therefore would be pretty useless as a counterbalance. This is just wonderful having them stalking through here. Hmm. Hello, Ravi. Another, another nice question. Very fresh wildebeest tracks here. Now, I said that they wouldn't follow the wildebeest herd. I suspect that maybe they are stalking through here, hoping that they will get caught in the thickets here. That's interesting. Um, Ravi, you want to know about whether or not I th or you think that there's a, a skewed ratio of prey to predators, and is this some kind of evolutionary adaptation? Um, Ravi, it's, it is, and it's well known. It's completely normal. And basically, it, in any ecosystem, you will find that the ratio of prey to predators heavily favors the prey. And that's simply because, I mean, the higher up the food chain you are, the fewer of you there are going to be. And as soon as, it's a delicate, what we call um, dynamic equilibrium, on a very simple level, um, what 
what you have, and because you'll see this in, a, say, I mean, if you look at foxes and hares, for example, lions and wildebeest, or lions and their prey items, as the populations of prey go up, so the predator populations will start to meet them, and then once the predator populations reach a certain level, the prey populations will then start to decline, and as they start to decline, so the predator populations will follow them into decline. So it is this kind of dynamic equilibrium where the prey and predator numbers are constantly kind of dancing around each other. But always you will find that there are fewer predators than there are prey in any given ecosystem. That's just the way it works. question from you, um, Dr. Debbie, you want to know how much does it throw off the hunt if one of the pride members is missing, like uh, the one of these lionesses is, she's a, well, she's a busy solidifying, shall we say, her bond with the, with the Birmingham boys, look up here, look up on the termite mound there, how cool is that, oh that's just wonderful. Dr. Debbie, um, I don't think hugely. Remember that often with these lionesses, three is kind of, um, three and above, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of advantage to having any more in the pride as far as hunting goes. So while there are four of them here, you know, one of them is a sub-adult, so maybe <laughs> that, is, that is quintessential sphinx-like lion behavior, isn't it? Let me just move this. See if we can get a decent shot here. You might get an epic screenshot of this. We're going to get quite close here, everybody. So just hold your breath. Don't make any loud noises. This is fantastic. Gary, you want to know why she wants to sit on that termite mound? Gary, simply because it gives her a vantage point. She can see what's going on around her. A termite mound is probably 10 feet high, more maybe, and so she's 10 feet above. Remember that the vegetation here is quite thick but there's not much topography, so even 10 feet up will give you an amazing vantage. Look at this. Isn't that wonderful? Jamie. I've just got to quickly talk to Jamie. Go ahead. A affirmative, slowly in a westerly direction. I'm just going to call them in now. Ephraim, we've just located in Kuhuma Pride, uh, Mobile West, through the block from Zoe's Road. Uh, they will probably pop out at some stage on Impala Plains. This is incredible stuff. Marvelous. I hope you got some screenshots there, everybody. So often you have a lion sitting above you. It's normally us looking down on them. Hello, Mercedes. We were looking there at the lioness um, sharpening her claws. And you want to know if they keep growing like the human nail does. Yes, they do. Just like your house cats, just like your dogs, they will keep growing. Whole life. But of course, they use them quite a lot more than a house cat uses its claws. 
thank you for all the screenshots you've sent through. So I think they're probably getting to the stage where they're going to think about going to sleep for the rest of the day. They seem to have run out of steam after the excesses of the morning. Gosh, they have given us a wonderful run around. Hello, Michelle. Um, you want to know how far we've moved along from where we started. Well, quarantine clearings as the crow flies is... Mm, sort of basically exactly where that line's looking. About three or four, mm, no, maybe 500 metres, half a kilometre. So just over, just over a quarter mile. So not far. And a little bit more than that. Called a third of a mile, 600 metres. It always seems like they move further than they do, but it's not often that very far. I, mean, I think we'll sit here another five minutes and see if they do get up and do anything, but I suspect quite strongly that the entertainment is up. decide what else we can do this after this morning on this little piece of paradise that we're very privileged to call home. Look at the car. It's just too wonderful. Lenny, an in interesting one from Pennsylvania. Um, you've heard us say, I'm just looking at that one there. You've heard us say that the lions don't attack us in the vehicles simply because they don't see us or smell us or perceive us as prey. They also are not threatened by us standing up in our bipedal posture and therefore they don't sort of charge us and say go away or run away from us. And you want to know, does that situation change in the night? Um, yes, it does to a certain extent. Lenny, remember, a lion does never sees a human being as a prey during the daytime. A lion sees a human being as a threat, as a predator. And so any time a lion reacts in an aggressive fashion to a human being, I mean, bar the very odd exception to this rule, which tends to kind of prove it rather than disprove it, a lion sees a human being as a threat, so if they ever were to act in an aggressive way, it would be because they felt threatened. Now, Lenny, at night time that does change because a lion, that's when a lion is very clearly on top of its game. And also, at night time we can't see, and they can tell we can't see. If you blunder about in the darkness, tripping over things and walking into trees, they'll immediately be able to see it. They will see the way that you don't see them, and then you will suddenly become very much like a prey item. So lions on foot in the night are certainly dangerous to human beings. Lions on foot in the day almost, I mean, there certainly are far more potentially dangerous things out here than a lion on foot during the day. And they just don't realize how basically pathetic physically we are. It's a completely psychological myth that they have developed over the millennia of us hunting them, that we as are physically capable. We're, as far as a mammal goes, we are physically very incapable out here. We're slow at running. We're not very strong when it comes to defending ourselves with our arms. Our greatest weapon is our brain. As I can comprehensively say to you that a lion's greatest weapon is certainly not its brain.
Hello, book diva. You are wanting to know what a lion weighs. A lioness weighs about 120 kilograms, which is about 240 pounds. Thank you, Dave. She's seen something, and I don't think she's stalking a mate. I think she's stalking her friends. That's Amber Eyes. Look at how she's stuck her shoulders up. She spotted something. In there. Let's just watch. Oh, she's going to go back to sleep. I'm not sure. So, book diva, about 120 kilograms, 240 pounds, a big male, 180, 200 kilograms, which in turn works out at about 440 pounds for a big male. That's pretty, that's pretty large. Okay, I think we're going to pack it in now and go and see what else we can find. I don't think these... <laughs> I don't think these lions are going to do much. That one has got an itchy belly. is hilarious. Just we'll see when she lies down. I think there's something through the thicket there that caught the attention of one of them. Now, while they won't normally hunt during the day, if something was to come past here and provide them with an opportunity, they certainly wouldn't stare the proverbial gift horse in the mouth. They'd absolutely take it down if, say, a wildebeest came wandering through here. <laughs> All righty, I think let's go and see what else we can find. We might pop back here a little bit later and see if they're still around. Good, well, that was an excellent start to the morning. Lucky we were. Dave, I'm going to ask you to do something very difficult here. There is a scraggly branch here with a red bug on the top of it. Can you see it? Just in front of us, a branch that goes up like that. And there's a bright red bug on the top of it. So if you come, um, come, no, it's the one to the right of where you are now. That's it, there. If you zoom in on my finger, that's it there, 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 well done. Good job. Look at that beautiful, beautiful color. Mm. I'm just trying to figure out what that is. Absolutely no idea what it is. So I'm going to have to talk on the radio, everybody. Please excuse me one second. Those animals are now west of Zoe's Road in the thicket. At one station here. I need to try and pull out. What is your location? Sorry, everyone. I just need to quickly sort out somebody else trying to come into the sighting. Station looking to come to Nkuhuma Pride, come in. One small station looking to come to Nkuhuma Pride, come in, please. Stand by, stand by. Did you copy my message? The animals are to the west of Zoe's Road. Yes, I copy. I copy. I'm going to leave the sighting. The animals are static. I will leave a branch on the road where I come out. You just need to follow my vehicle tracks in there. Copy, all right. 
everybody. This is a wonderful start. So, of course, normally the radio and that sort of thing would be handled off air, but because we are the only air there is, we're going to have to wash it all. as I thought they were going to be. I thought there'd be much more, especially as we've had a bit of heat now after the rain. And so uh, not as nearly as many as I thought there would be. Dave, have you noticed yeah. any more mosquitoes? No. So, I, and strangely not, Curtis, which is of course uh, not something we're going to complain about. We do not like mosquitoes. They are a great pestilence on the land. And I don't really know why that should be the case, Curtis. Oh, unfortunately, for the chap trying to come to the sighting, he's going to struggle to find those lines unless he's very good at following vehicle tracks. But it should be all right. It's quite wet through here, so... and put it on the road so that he can then follow from there. As you can see the cloud, I mean, it's, well, it looks like it might rain, Dov, but I don't think it's going to. I'm not sure what the fictional weather, weather report says for the day. It's a break of a very large piece here. Chris Rogue, you're trying to identify that red bug that we were looking at, and you want to know if it wasn't perhaps a red burnet moth. No, Chris, I looked at it with my binoculars. It wasn't a moth at all. I don't know what it was. I'm going to have a look a bit later. Um, I think a bug. So, um, uh, bug, of course, is not just a, a term that we use to describe uh, creepy things that make us scared. It's actually a biological term to which the ladybugs, the cicadas, um, what else, the obvious bugs that occur, ladybugs, cicadas, assassin bugs, those sorts of things, uh, stink bugs, they all belong to the same order, and I think that was one of the order. So, I'll try and find out which one it was. Right, there you are, fellow, good luck when you arrive here. That's an obvious enough branch, Dave. I make something a bit more obvious. I'm going to 
put another branch there, everybody. Hold on. Sorry about this. Must be done. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. So embarrassing. There we go. This is an obvious branch. There we go. That oh, looks like an elephant's been feeding there. Okay, let's go and see if there's some hyenas at their den. Judy H, you say that I should draw a lion to go with the branch um, to indicate uh, where the lines are. Uh, Judy H, you obviously have seen my drawings before and therefore are uh, wishing for some comedy. Judy, um, as you know, I'm a terrible artist. The elephant that I drew looked somewhere between a duck called platypus and a kiwi, and so I'm not going to be drawing a lion uh, for some other ranger to follow. I am just going to tell him that I've left that branch there. And so just to direct him to those lions. Station looking for Nkuhuma Pride coming. But if he's not going to listen to his radio, I cannot help the man. Right, hyenas, here we go. rolling in, David. I did not bring my rain jacket today. Well, I've got mine. Oh, lucky old you. I might have to use it. I'm, of course, very important. <laughs> Cannot have me looking bedraggled on screen. something I perhaps should have explained. Uh, the name I think we're getting through is Gamiac. Is that the correct? Gamiac? Thing one. Uh, clearly. Oh, Gainiac. Gainiac. Uh, possibly not the name your mother gave you, but Gainiac, you want to know what the protocols are for calling in sightings and who's allowed to do what and how does it work. Well, it's supposed to work in a certain way that very seldom does, but it's supposed to work in that if you find something, you will call it in on the radio. You can then have two people coming to join you, so no more than three people at a sighting. If it's a very sensitive sighting, say of leopard cubs or something like that, then you'll maybe limited to one or two vehicles. But normally it's three, so that lion sighting would have been a three vehicle sighting. And then if you are the fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh person that wants to come and see them, then you have to stand by. And this is a sort of gentleman's agreement that you won't spend more than 15 to 20 minutes in a sighting before moving out and allowing some space for others to come and have a look-see. That's how it's supposed to work. And then the person who finds them first is normally the one who controls the sighting until the second person comes and they take over control and then the third person. So if you've got guests, excuse me, if you've got guests on the back of the vehicle, you're not always constantly on the radio kind of the responsibility for running who's coming and who isn't and you know how to direct them right. falls uh, to the changes as it goes. So I hope that helps you understand. Now, of course, the main thing, the most important thing on the radio is to listen to it. And it's one of the most difficult things for any guide to learn to do. Most never learn it. And you find that um, it can become a real intrusive influence on the game driver radio if people are not listening to their radios. operate without them.
really does help us a lot. Obviously, the huge amounts of land that we need to follow and need to cover, so we need to be able to talk to each other. So I, was, I was rather hoping the sun would come out, but it doesn't look like it's about to burst through the clouds and great rays of golden sunshine. Texas, I think you're probably right. I called a bug a ladybug, a bug, at least a ladybug, a bug. But you want to know, oh, yeah. you said you think that they're beetles, and uh, so it would seem, Jeffrey, there they are in the, uh, in the book. And they are indeed in the section, if you look to the bottom left-hand side, called Coleoptera, or beetles. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for making a fool of me on live television. Of course, I made a fool of myself long before you did. Thank you for that, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, of course, pointed out where the sausage tree is on this reserve. Uh, Jeffrey lives in Texas, and yet he knows where the sausage tree is on this reserve. So I'm not entirely surprised that he managed to school me in my entomology for the day. Thank you for that, Jeff. It's so embarrassing. Well, we're not too far from the hyenas now. Quietening down of the morning already, I think as a result of the thickening of the mist. There's just two birds I want you to hear quickly. There are two birds to hear. One is the Steerling's barred warbler that's going tick -tick, tick -tick, tick -tick, tick -tick. Oh, there's another one. There's also the chin spot batters going. And then there's the crested barbet going. Here's the barbet. I'll just quickly show you what I'm hearing. But it's that other one is a tick 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 is the most unusual. There is the crested barbet, beautiful scruffy bird. We see them quite often, they're quite common. And then the Steerling's barred warbler, oh, sorry, it's now called the Steerling's wren warbler. Warbler. Hello. Stealing's Ren Warbler. Very difficult to see, very seldom to see them. Thank you very much, Katie, for your uh, question as to whether I need a map to get to the hyena den or not. referring to the fact that despite the fact that I had been to the hyena den for oh, maybe 20 times, I got lost going to it the other day. Thank you, Katie, for pointing that out to everybody. Um, no, I don't need a map. I have Dave with me. He will remember where it is, so we should be okay. And then Katie in Nebraska. I'm not sure if you're the same Katie or not, but you want to know if birds have a sense of smell. Um, Katie in Nebraska, birds do 
have a sense of smell. Not all of them. Um, for example, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the um, the crown lapwing doesn't have uh, nasal passages anymore. They've closed up and they've been replaced by salt glands. But certainly many birds do, and the most obvious birds that do use their sense of smell extensively are the buzzards or New World vultures. So your vultures that you have got in the New World, most closely related to our storks, who also use their noses to find prey. So yes, very strong sense of smell many birds have. Thank you, Katie. That was the uh, road I took last time to the hyena den. We got there in the end. Thank you, Jeffrey, for your, <laughs> your, your kind comment that um, I'm being a good sport about it. Is it over here, Dave? Thanks. Okay, Dave says that we must go up here to find the hyenas. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. nervous with the baboon's tail. You can see why it's called a baboon's tail. And for most of the season, it has been a dry, very unattractive kind of stump. No leaves on it at all, just those kind of baboon's tail protrusions coming out of the ground. And now, within a week of the rain, it has put out some new flowers. Isn't that lovely? Stunning flowers. That's interesting, and I don't know if they have a smell. Um, Louise, I will try and find out if they have a smell, but obviously I'm going to get out of the car right here. But they are white, and so it's quite likely that they do have a smell. White flowers often have a smell, where red ones do not. Now, let's just pop up here. I know that there weren't any hyenas here yesterday evening. if they haven't moved. I've always had the impression that this was going to be a little temporary den for them for a little while before they pressed on. Now, Jamie, you want to know how often they change den. Well, they'll tell you, the books will tell you every six weeks or so. But they were at the den before this for at least eight to ten weeks. And this one I've never seen occupied for more than three or four weeks. possible that the youngsters are inside there and that the adults are still foraging or lurking somewhere in the bushes. But you can see there where they live in that hole but I don't see them here. So I think what we're going to do is check a few of the other den sites and see what we can find on our way. Interesting. I don't think they were here last night. Did anyone come and check? Yeah, me and Brent did. Okay, and they weren't here last night. Hmm. Right, well, that's that then. Right, we'll go and check another site. An easy one to find, but Dave doesn't know. Who he, Dave's never been there, so he can't tell me. 
Hello, Diana. You want to know a little bit about the weather here and how cold it can get. Diana, you say where you live, it gets very cold and the pipes freeze sometimes. Diana, this is one of the great advantages of living in this area, is that the winter is uh, arguably the best time of year here. It gets coldish to about 4 degrees Celsius, uh, which is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, not very cold, and so no pipes freeze out here where we are. And then in the middle of the day in winter, it'll normally be around 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, which is it's approaching 80, I mean 75 degrees Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit or so during the winter time, which is a brilliant winter temperature. And there are some parts of South Africa will, which will get that cold. For example, um, parts of the Free State or the high-lying areas, a uh, place called uh, Belfast or Dulstrom, which are very high up, sort of 2,000 meters above sea level. That's about 6,600 feet above sea level. They will sometimes uh, get freezing. And the eastern highlands of the Eastern Cape and down into the Drakensberg Mountains, they will drop below zero quite often. Um, but very, you know, the coldest place in the country is a place called Sutherland, and it will go down to I suppose some, sometimes minus 10, maybe during the early, early morning. That's really a very, very cold day, though. And that minus 10 will change during the middle of the day. Hello, Avril. You are Geraldine's mother. Um, now, <laughs> you, first of all, you were most amused by the fact that I might have got lost going to the hyena den. As you can see, I did not get lost going to the hyena den there, Avril. Thank you for that. Um, I would also like you to ask your daughter the next time she comes home to um, make you the new and improved cheesecake. Now, everybody, for those of you who don't know, Geraldine arrived with great fanfare a few weeks back and said she had a cheesecake recipe that she was going to share with us. And she was very specific about how this thing should be made and had very exact quantities. There are some hyenas there. 71. Sorry, Dave. You're not with us. And I will continue the story, of, the sad story of Geraldine and the cheesecake once we've had a look at this one. two youngsters. That's D1 and D2, I think. And that's the size they are. And this, this is a totally different situation. Isn't that a perfect little picture of them lying on their hole there? So what they would have done is excavated this burrow. They would have excavated some holes 
they would have created for themselves inside the den an easy place to sit, a safe place where no other predator can get in. So were a lion to come across here, they wouldn't be able to get their faces into where those little cubs are going to hide. And they will unfortunately probably go back down into the den now as the matriarch goes off. So the female is leaving. really interesting. She's just over there. She's disappearing. This is a tiny, very unsalubrious neighborhood. Nothing like the two previous dens they had. Let's just see if my identification of these two little ones is correct. The best way to do that is going to be to see the back left foot of the little one looking up into the air now. But I'm pretty sure that's who these two are, the D twins, born in December. It is quite strange. They should be out here on their own with no adults around. Their little claws. Now you can see their little claws sticking out there. And they'll be blunt, much like a dog's claws. And you can always see a hyena's claws in its track. You, you say that the hyenas have gone den shopping. Yes, they do seem to have gone shopping for dens. They haven't found a very nice one here. I suspect quite strongly that this is a temporary refuge. And that it's not going to be occupied for too long. Yes, I think Katie's absolutely correct. Katie, you say I've just been put on babysitting duty. As I arrived, the mother said, well, there you go. These are yours. You look after them. Of course, not their mother, that one. If these are who I think they are, I don't see how they could be anyone else, really. If them some sort of upheaval last night, some kind of fight, A few of the crew went out on a night drive last night and found a hyena with a, carrying a leg of some sort. It was an antelope, presumably, was it? No, I think so. And so they were out and about, not too far from here. Hmm. They'll probably go into the den. You can see them edging towards the hole. Much like the cats, of course, they will sleep for most of the day, although they're a little bit more active, thankfully. And that, <laughs> that everybody, is that. James Richard, you say you wonder how long it will, if the hyenas wonder how long it will take for me to find their new den. And they move it. Well, in this case, not very long. It was right next to the road there. I mean, we were right next to the road there. Um, right, I think we should carry on with the story of the uh, Jerry and the Cheesecake. So, somebody else has been in here, though. Somebody else has driven in here yesterday. I can see their tracks. So this is not as new as... Uh, yeah, it's not as new as yesterday. It must have been a day or two ago that they moved here. I'm 
still going to check the other one because I'm not sure that they're all there. Okay. So, Jerry arrived with a cheesecake recipe and very, very definite on how it should be made. And so she made a cheesecake. It was delicious. It was really delicious. Then she got it into her head, of course, that she needed help with this thing. And then no one helped her the second time she made it. And it was equally delicious the second time. And then the third time, she just refused to make it because no one would help her, you see. So Kirsten and I took up the mantle of the cheesecake chefs, and we made it ourselves. We made a few modifications. And the biggest thing that we did, of course, was freeze it, because it's summertime here. And the camp went into raptures of joy when they tasted our frozen cheesecake with a very slightly modified recipe. Jerry, of course, by this stage had left for Johannesburg, and when she was sent pictures of uh, this cheesecake and the camp basically lying about in absolute wonderment and joy at what they'd been given to eat, well, I feel that she, she became slightly jealous. Anyway, she re returned the other day, and uh, Jerry and I then made a, another f frozen cheesecake. I do feel that she, uh, she referred to me as a bad sous chef, which given that I was teaching her the new recipe, I thought was a bit un un unfair. But she also had apoplectic fit. When I was, didn't, um, I don't, I don't measure anything, you see. I just kind of guess the quantities. And, well, like all great chefs do, you know. I mean, how often do you see Gordon Ramsay with a, a cup measure checking things? Or Jamie Oliver um, weighing out how many chives he should put in his soup. He just knows. And with all great chefs, we just know. We, we have a feeling as to how much should go in the cheesecake, you see. And um, it, was a, it was a roaring success. And the reason it's a roaring success, of course, is because you, if you freeze in something, it's very difficult for it not to be a success on the hot day out here. Sweet and frozen, delicious. I'm actually one of the world's worst cooks. So, I mean, the fact that we've managed to make this cheesecake is a testament to the ease of the recipe. Thank you, Jerry. You can make another one now if you like. You can go back to camp. Louise will handle the final control and we will have cheesecake for breakfast. Now, Geraldine is now challenging me to a souffle off. Jerry, you can happily have that one. You win. I'm not a chef. I'm not a cook. Souffle would unquestionably end up as a disgusting mush if I tried to make it. Okay, we're going to check the old den, see what's happening there, and then we'll head across to Bubbles Hook and see what's going on there. Kevin, that's interesting. You say, could the Kahuma ladies have caused the hyenas to move? No, I don't think so. Simply because I don't think they came from that direction. As you say, Kevin, the lions were calling most of last night. But they came from the east, and they didn't come from down here. So, no, I don't think that they would have caused them to move, especially not so close. You know, I mean, if hyenas will move their dens if there's a lot of predator pressure. But they are, I mean, they're so close to the old one. The old one, when we arrived there, I don't know if you smelled it, Dave, smelled quite niffy. There was a bit of smell of rotting something there. And maybe the disease was getting a bit bad. Um, Dave, here is a pool of Coca-Cola. This is obviously not Coca-Cola, everybody. But it is one of those very rare pools out here that has been sand filtered and unsoiled by buffalo dung. So there's some interesting little things that live in it. And one of the things I, whenever I drive past this little pool, I hope to see is a green-backed heron. And a green-backed heron would sit on that branch on the top of your screen there, the very top of your screen. He would sit there and wait. He'd probably pick up an insect or a small leaf out and place it on the surface of the water as a bait for the fish. And then as the fish rise to bite on that leaf or that little insect that's been specially placed there, 
the heron would drop off the branch and grab it. But this is a fairly stagnant pond at the moment. And we were talking about mosquitoes earlier. Well, if the mosquitoes are going to come from anywhere, it is a pool like this one. Right. seem to be largely scavengers and how much of their diet is made up, that was a dung beetle flying overhead, how much of their diet is made up of kills that they make their own. Depends where they live. In this area they are largely scavengers, they don't kill a great deal on their own. They will kill lamb, um, impala lambs during the lambing season because they're pretty easy to get a hold of. But over here largely scavengers in East Africa the migration of wildebeest, two million of them takes place, uh, you'll find that they do a lot more hunting and in some areas they even hunt more than lions. So it's very difficult to say what proportion of their diets are made up by scavenging and what by fresh kills. But I'd say in this area, and I'm guessing here, I would say probably about 80 to 90 percent is scavenging would be made up by live kills. They will, of course, eat anything. If they find an African bullfrog sitting on the road, they'll eat that. If they find a squirrel that is not be paying attention, they'll eat that. So they will eat just about anything that has a meaty quality. Right, we're now approaching the old hyena den. Let's see if there isn't anything going on here. Safari Dean, you're going to get yourself into trouble because you might find that this is the last time I ever acknowledge your presence. You say that you bet Jerry's cheesecake was better than mine. It most certainly was not. The only reason mine was better was that it was frozen. And of course, it is summertime here. No, this den has not been reoccupied as far as I can see. tracks around here. I'm just going to pop out and I want to show you something quickly. Um, Safari Dean. <laughs> something quite vicious here. I'm just going to try and retrieve it. It's called a... Oh, no. I had him. He's an ant. He's a vicious-looking ant. And I think he's known as the Matabili ant, if I'm not mistaken. He's huge. Can you see how big he is? With the big jaws. You don't want those things sticking into you. Isn't he wonderful? I can just hear some cracking of branches off to the side there. Am I making this impossible, Dave? No, you're right. Perfect. Isn't he amazing? The way he moves? Huge thing. He's about, well, I mean, you can see how big he is. It's a buffalo. Dave, there's a buffalo over there. Now, so often we found buffalo around here. They just seem to be on a path. It grazes towards, I think, the Gallagher waterhole. It's not too far from here. And I think that's what they are, are going for. They're kind of nice grazing grass through here, through the woodland, and then they go for a drink there. And I'm just going to very quietly sneak up here. Many buffalo tracks.
definitely no fresh activity of the hyenas here. But what I did want to remind you of was that there was a pygmy kingfisher that nested inside this very cavity here. And it's precisely where those... Speak up, James. Precisely where those two hyenas we saw there, the little ones, were born. They were born in this hole, and inside it, a little kingfisher decided to nest with them. Now, I don't think the buffalo will be most pleased to hear me shouting across the bushveld like this, so that you can hear me. So I think I shall get back into the car. In fact, he is... <laughs> look at him staring. <laughs> as I got back into the car, he was looking at me as if to say, what do you think you're doing? Fair enough. Disturb the poor fellow. Okay, let's make our way out of here. And I think we will go to Boothel's Hook Dam now. Let's see what we can find there. I don't think we will require the spotlight any longer, given that it is now daytime. Right, on we go. Certainly the flies have been very enthusiastic as a result of the rain. I don't know, actually. I don't think so. I've never heard of a bullet ant before. Um, but in the same breath, you want to know what animal has the worst sting here. Um, Clayton, I think you'll find some members of the order Hymenoptera. So the wasps have some very nasty stings around here. And I was set upon, I've told the story before, uh, I was on the golf course the other day uh, about, when was it? Probably almost a year ago, in fact at least a year ago. And uh, for me to be on the golf course means that I'm largely in bush, sort of this thick, looking for my ball. And I disturbed a, a nest of wasps that set upon my head. Now, the pain was utterly excruciating. I think I was stung about 50 times all over the top of my balding head. And I let out a very loud yell, and indeed may have said some words that would be unrepeatable on the live stream. But that was very painful indeed. So I think that, I think it's probably a wasp that's the most painful sting, but you also get this thing called a blister beetle, which produces a poison called cantharidin, and that blisters the skin, and that's pretty unpleasant. And I was set upon by one of those the other day on my ankle, and indeed I, I showed everybody the incredible injury that it did to me. It didn't really do me an incredible injury, it does just blister the skin, and it's not so much sore as it is uncomfortable and very strange. But there are not a lot of... People are often afraid of insects. Well, they're afraid of snakes more than before they're afraid of anything. Then spiders and then insects. And we don't have a great deal of spiders that are, are particularly harmful. In fact, we've got hardly any. And we don't have any insects that are particularly dangerous. Of course, the two most dangerous insects, I guess, are the mosquito, the Anopheles mosquito, which carries malaria and lives in that coke pond. Well done, David. And the other, I suppose, would be the common bee, because if you're allergic to a bee sting, of course, it can be fatal. I am mercifully not allergic to bees.
Okay, so bullet and... A bullet ant is... Um, a bullet ant is found in the New World. So in the forests of uh, apparently Paraguay, Honduras, Central America, and possibly up into the United States. And it's a very powerful sting. It's named for that very powerful sting that it has. It is in lowland forests. Thank you very much. I didn't just suck that out of the ether. That was read to me in my, in my earpiece. Thank you, Louise and Jerry. And then, of course, I mean, we were talking about stings uh, of insects. 